seeing the time, seeing a quorum, I call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for March 5th, 2019. We're going to, um, I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Troop 828 of Towson. We will then remain standing for a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Two. Thank you. Ms. White, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? There are no additions or changes. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To discuss one, the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. And nine, to conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. The minutes of the closed session and informational summary can be found on our website at www.bcps.org slash board slash informational dash summaries dot html. Our next item is agenda item D, selection of speakers. Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10, the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in this box, and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight during the public comment portion of the meeting. Of course, if fewer than 10 sign-up cards are received, all who sign up will be permitted to speak. Ms. Adekoya? Okay. Our first speaker is P.J. Schaefer. Our second is Ms. Diana Bergman. Our third is Colleen Carr. Our fourth is Kevin Leary. Our fifth is Tom Lenegro. Our sixth is Dr. Bosch Ferrone. And our seventh and final is Colleen Baldwin. Thank you. Next item is item E, public comment, where we invite our advisory and stakeholder groups. This is the one of the opportunities in public comment that the board he provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will, prefer, we will refer your concerns to the interim superintendent for follow-up by her staff. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper form to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupt or interfere with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask you to observe the three minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or see that time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters 
or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. I now call our advisory groups to speak. And first this evening, we have Mr. Ruben Amaya, who is president of the Baltimore County Student Council. Good evening. Good evening, Superintendent White and members of the board. Recently, this board proposed many initiatives. One of these included cuts to curriculum. And I must say, as president of the Baltimore County Student Councils, on behalf of every student in BCPS and a representative of every student in BCPS, I am very disappointed in the budget passed with cuts to curriculum. Instead of debating and proposing ideas that benefit students in our county, this board proposed cuts here and there raises to athletic directors without understanding that it has to be negotiated through TABCO, even entertaining the thought of taking away the passport program from students, which goes against everything we stand for uh, to prepare our students for a competitive world. This board is supposed to be a role model for the students of this county, especially with this event being live streamed. Imagine what students think when they watch all of you argue over personal agendas, political agendas, and not the student agenda. I ask that this board lives up to its promise and makes decisions with thought and a sense of preparedness. Who wouldn't want to add new things to our budget? But when it is brought up without reasoning and thought and instead through impulse, it negatively impacts the students of our county. And especially when cuts are being proposed, most specifically our curriculum, we must think of how that affects the various departments and members of faculty and most importantly our students when we propose a 2% cut to curriculum. With that being said, I am once again strongly disappointed in this board and the actions you all have taken. And I strongly encourage that you please consider the students when you make big decisions and policies. Thank you. Next this evening, we have Abby Baton, president of TABCO. Good evening. I'm going to keep my remarks brief tonight. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chairwoman Han, Ms. White, and members of the board. First, I want to thank you for passing the school budget at the last meeting and sending it on to the county executive. We know that the budget will have to be pared down and we will work with the county executive to find the cuts needed and still maintain as much as possible to move our school system forward. The county will need to trim areas, but will also need to raise revenues. People are willing to pay for good schools. Second, I want to thank the many of you who have signed up to march with us on Monday evening in Annapolis for funding for public education. Thank you, Ms. White. We have almost 1,000 folks signed up for the buses and several more are driving down separately. This rally is going to send a strong message to our legislators. The public wants to see our schools funded properly and are willing to pay to have that happen. Last, we cannot sit back and think a budget request to the county executive and a rally in Annapolis is enough to push public education funding to the levels needed. We are truly at a crossroads. Our students need additional staff to help them become successful and the staff needs additional hands to help them reach each and every child. As I often paraphrase Benjamin Franklin as he helped draft our Constitution, there must be a free public education for all paid for by the public in order for our country to be strong. His words still ring true today. Please continue to help us fight for our students and our nation. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker tonight is Tom DeHart, Executive Director of CASE. <coughs> Good evening, Mr. DeHart. Good evening, Chair Board, uh, board Chair Causey, Vice Chair Hen, Superintendent White, and members of the board. Five board meetings ago, Ms. Causey announced the formation of a student, I mean, a superintendent search committee. This is interesting because there are five more board meetings until state law requires that a permanent superintendent be in place. So what has occurred in those two and a half months? Frankly, not much, if we're to go by the often mentioned transparency of process. Uh, 
On December 12th, Ms. Hen, the chair of that search committee, shared with me in an email that, quote, all stakeholder groups will be involved in the process. One month later, on January 10th, I emailed Ms. Hen to inquire where the search committee was in the process. She replied, all communications regarding the search will be shared by board chair Kathleen Clausey. Later in January, it was announced that the Ray and Associates were contracted for a fee of up to $100,000. Then, nothing, until last week. On February 26, Ms. Hen shared with me on her Facebook page that, quote, the process hasn't started yet. The next day, Tim Tootin teased his evening report that BCPS is putting its superintendent search on the fast track. The next day, Ms. Hinn posted that the Board of Education begins the search process. That was the 28th. All of this is important because we are behind where we should be in this process if we really want to ensure true stakeholder involvement. As of now, the listing for the BCPS superintendent on the Ray and Associate website says, coming soon. The board has announced a five-phase process for the search. Phase one is board input and preparation. But what does this mean? Does it mean the board decides who can and who can't apply? If so, I'm concerned because the leadership of this board has already gone on record uh, as not wanting our current superintendent to even be able to apply for the permanent position. I am calling for a public release of the documents for phase one, and in fact of all phases, understanding that candidate confidentiality may be a, necess a necessity during phase three. These phases are extremely time intensive. While it can be accomplished, it is important for the board and based on what I've been told, Ms. Causey to be far more transparent regarding the process and ensure that all stakeholders are authentically involved and regularly updated. And while we're on the topic of transparency, I have heard that the board may release the results of the audit tonight. It's about time. The board has had it for a month. Enough already. Ms. White has twisted in the wind with more grace and decorum than any average person could muster. Release the audit and let the pieces fall where they may. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the Northeast Area Ed Education Advisory Council, Mr. Thor Torgeson. Good evening, board members. <clears throat> I'm here tonight on behalf of uh, parents in the Northeast area who have been uh, recently been uh, particularly badly hit with bus issues. Bus transportation within BCPS is an old issue dating back years. That seems to come up every school year, particularly at the start of the school year. What is unusual is the current issue that we have for Perry Hall Middle School and other schools in the Northeast area in the middle of the winter. All of a sudden, there seems to be an acute shortage of drivers that has a profound effect on families in the area. What is even worse is that there are a complete breakdown of com communications from the Office of Transportation to the affected parents. Parents have been reaching out to us at the Northeast Advisory Board, worried about the reliability of transportation for their children. We share those worries. We have stories of kids waiting up to an hour on a street corner in sub-freezing temperatures, waiting patiently for a bus that never came. We have stories of kids waiting more than 90 minutes at the school before they were finally able to board a bus and be homeward bound. Neither instances generated any notifications from transportation. We have reports of notifications sent 30 to 40 minutes after the bus was supposed to be there, announcing that the bus is 45 minutes late. What is even worse is that transportation most of the time hasn't notified parents of any issues. Most of the time, parents hear nothing from BCPS. Why hasn't BCPS notified parents about the shortage? Why haven't parents been told that this situation will most likely be around for another two weeks? How can you, your staffing and planning break down so completely that it has come to this? Me? talking to you in a public meeting about problems that transportation has and the effects that it has on fam families in the community. 
When there's an issue, leaders step up and find solutions. If they are unable to find solutions, they need to step aside and let people that can solve the problem assume that position. Parents need BCPS to provide timely, accurate information daily on any and all delays that can affect transportation to and from any school. Not just when somebody at transportation remembers that a notification should be sent out. Parents cannot endure two more weeks with unreliable transportation. This has got to change and it has got to change today. Thank you. Thank you. And next from the Northwest Area Education Advisory Council is Mr. Clifford Collins. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Kathleen Causey, Vice Chair Julie Hen, Interim Superintendent Berlita White. On Thursday, February 28th, the Randallstown NAACP hosted a meet and greet reception for school board members Makita Scott, Cheryl Pasteur, Lisa Mack, and student board member Halima Adekoya. Interim Superintendent Berlita White attended this event during which she acknowledged a host of recent achievements of schools and professional staff in the Western Zone. Ms. White also, Ms. White also congratulated Ms. Adekoya for receiving the 2019 Young Woman of the Year Award from the Baltimore County Commission on Women. School Board Chair Kathleen Causey, Board Members Lily Rowe, John Offerman, and Rod McMillian were in attendance. You may recall during the February 5th board meeting, I expressed my disappointment with your initial decision not to place the external report on your agenda. Just before the adjournment of the February 19th meeting, <coughs> Molly Joes proffered a motion to place the external audit report on the next board meeting. This time, the motion passed. During the meet and greet reception, a question was raised, when will the external report external audit report be released to the public. Lisa Mack stated that the board will review the report during its closed session on March 5th, but did not know when the report will be released to the public. Assuming the board had a chance to review and discuss the exter external report during the night tonight's closed session, the Northwest Area Education Advisory Council and many stakeholders in Baltimore County now want to know when will the board will release the external audit report to the public. We find it extremely troubling that board, the board appears to be more concerned about accelerating the process for conducting a superintendent search rather than releasing the external re audit report that is apparently favorable to the interim superintendent and the school system's administration. According to Liz Bowie's article in the Baltimore Sun, the school administration has already accepted the external audit report and is prepared, that was prepared by the independent external auditors. Again, I challenge the board to reach that same conclusion now rather than later. The so-called ad hoc committee on the external audit, the board's audit committee, and the school board leadership must immediately dispense with what has been several weeks of perceived intentional delays in releasing of the external audit for the report, for audit report to the public. I close by asking you to exercise your, the right to, to pass, that, uh, pass the audit at all deliberate speed. Thank you very much. Thank you. And finally this evening, we have uh, Mr. Ryan Coleman from Randallstown NAACP. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chair. Superintendent White and school board members. Uh, Mr. Collins has stole all my thunder about our <laughs> great meeting <laughs> that we had last week, but it was a great event. Um, Madam Chair was there, Superintendent White was there, of course our panelists, uh, 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 Cheryl Pastor was there, Mesquita, uh, Makita Scott, uh, Miss Mack, and also our student school board member was there as well. And we had a really good time and it was, it was very encouraging to see uh, everyone there, and everyone had a focus around children. 
And so I wanted to definitely start with, with good news <laughs> tonight. Three of the main questions out of that um, event that kept coming up was the audit, of course, the search, <clears throat> and then discipline was another major issue. Um, obviously, we feel it's of great concern that the audit report has not been released as well. And we, as uh, Mr. Collins said, believe that it's favorable to, the obviously, the current administration. Um, keeping children in mind here, um, the other point was uh, people were concerned about the search. I know when I worked for Joe Harrison, he was, he was in place now. He was here in March, okay? So we're definitely starting behind the ball um, with this search. Dr. Dance was here in April. Um, obviously, we hope that um, what Ms. White has already done, she's shown tremendous grace dealing with the different issues and the attacks on her character. We obviously believe that she is the right candidate to move the school forward, to move the system forward. We don't have time for someone to wait two or three years getting acclimated. Ms. White, she knows what's going on on the west side, the east side. If you talk to her, you can, you can definitely see. She knows what's going on out in the Hereford zone. Uh, if you look at her budget, she understands what's important, what she needs to do to push the system forward, okay? And we hope that she's given the opportunity to be the superintendent. The last and final um, question that came up was on discipline, and we actually had a student from Woodlawn who wrote this. Schools are seeming to become more violent. The county seems to be more lenient with violence in our schools. What is being done about public safety and the welfare of students such as me? As a sophomore of Woodlawn High, I'm used to seeing violence, low education rates, and armed weapons. How am I being protected in my school? We're going to forward all the additional questions that came up in our meet and greet to uh, Madam Chair. We hope to get a response to those questions um, as well. And I thank you and I look forward to the rest of the meeting. Thank you. Now it's the opportunity for our public to come forward and our first speaker is PJ Schaefer. Good evening. Good evening. Let me first apologize for getting on the wrong list. I should have been here with the CCAC and not the public comment. But uh, nonetheless, I'm here. Um, good evening, Chairman Causey, uh, Vice Chairman Hen, Ms. White, members of the board. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm P.J. Schaefer. I'm the past chair of the CCAC and the parent, proud parent of an 11th grader at Newtown High School. I'd like to thank first everybody who attended our monthly CCAC meeting uh, last night on the topic of literacy. We, uh, we appreciated hearing from Ms. Rebecca Ryder, Megan Shea, Karen Blannard, and numerous BCPS staff who participated in the meeting. We were also especially grateful for the school-based teachers uh, and administrators who took time to share success stories with the Orton-Gillingham professional development, especially those from Lansdowne Elementary, Mars Estates Elementary, 7th District Elementary, and Patapsco High School. It was a wonderful opportunity for us to learn about literacy leaders in BCPS and road their paving for the success of our students. Turning our attention to the budget, we recognize that you are working with, within significant constraints. We'd like to remind you of two significant issues. First, special ed resources are paramount for meeting legally bound IEP requirements. We simply must have enough resources to avoid noncompliance and the further expenses that entails. Second, special ed resources benefit all students and teachers across the system. CCAC continues to advocate for the following positions. Additional teachers for infants and toddlers, as needs of more students are served each year through the program. Early intervention is critical to prevent gaps of our students and to establish early pathways for success. These positions must remain in the budget. We continue to advocate for additional elementary special education teachers to cover outside general education hours for all elementary schools. All elementary schools should have adequate staffing to ensure the students' needs can be met from preschool through fifth grade for inclusion opportunities, for access to special ed instruction both in and outside the classroom as appropriate. 
We advocate for the expansion of existing regional programs so that students requiring more intensive services can have the needs met in a school closest to their home with typical peers in the school with less time spent on the bus. BCPS continues to see growth in enrollment for students with autism. We need to ensure these regional options continue to be provided for students. Elementary special education teachers must remain as planned in the budget. We also continue to educate for power educators to remain in the budget. This is critical so for support staff for implementing activities and strategies to meet the diverse learning needs and IEP goals and objections of ob objectives of students. The last point I'll make is did any of you see the Sun article today about the Kerwin report? Do you see what Thank you. And our next speaker this evening is Diana Bergman. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. So like our student member um, Ruben Abaya said, I'm disappointed. I really feel like you guys gave me lemons yesterday. Um, and that's OK, because you give me lemons. I don't just make lemonade. I built the whole lemonade stand. So yesterday, I had a busy day. I was down in Annapolis early, helping to fight for DD community to make sure they got the original funding for the fight for 15. And I showed up late to the CTAC committee. But you know what? I showed up. And we didn't have a single board member. And the current commission, they came out with the report today for House Bill 1413, Senate Bill 1030 for the blueprint for Maryland's future. And um, they have some big numbers there, $125 million for special education. And I felt like if, if Baltimore County was following the work of the current commission from the beginning, we would have gotten a larger percentage. PG County got the largest percentage for special education, 15.45%. Baltimore City got 1487%. Montgomery County got 1395. Baltimore County got 1290, 12.93%. Um, and we're the 25th largest school district in the nation with a lot of children that have special education needs from autism and multiple diagnoses that need these additional supports. This is not a department that you cut. These are our, our most vulnerable population in education. These children have every right to be educated and receive the appropriate um, services that they need because then it becomes a civil rights issue. The federal government has protected these children to make sure that they get access to an education like any regular child. Then we have something that's new that hopefully will go through, and this will help the Ready to Read Act, which is our struggling um, learners, meaning a student who's performed before a grade level for ELA, reading K through. And um, Baltimore County got 9.8 grants. Then the, I mean, sorry, 2.6. The 9.8 um, grant was the teacher salary. So it's time to focus on our children, our students and our children, and focus on the details of what's going on around us because we're leaving money, state money, on the table since we're not paying attention. And everybody better get on the bus on March 11. Everybody gets on that bus and fights for our kids and advocate for our kids to get that money. Because if you don't, I will call you out on it. I'm going to find out who got on the party bus and who didn't. So, thank you, and please pay attention. There's a lot of stuff and moving pieces going on around us, and we can't let our most vulnerable population of students be exposed. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker for this evening is Colleen Carr. Good evening. Hi. <clears throat> Good evening, Chairwoman Kazi, Vice Chair Hen, and members of the board, and Interim Superintendent White. I appreciate the opportunity to say a few words. My name is Colleen Carr, and I am the proud parent of a first grader at Pleasant Plains Elementary, and I'm also a member of the school's PTA. Let me start by saying that we greatly appreciate this proposed staffing changes for our school that include 
include increased administrator support and additional classroom teachers. I have another son who will be in kindergarten this fall, and I am glad to know that he will be less likely to face the issue my first grader faced last year when an additional kindergarten class had to be added after the start of the school year. I can only imagine the headaches that created scheduling-wise for the administrators, as well as the social implications for students being put into another new classroom just as they were getting adjusting to their, new, their classmates' teacher and routines. I am, however, very concerned about the fact that initial staffing projections for the 2019-2020 school year did not include any behavior intervention support. Zero. None. This year, the school was given a second behavior interventionist. There are not expected to be drastic changes in enrollment or demographics, so the lack of behavioral interventionists is unacceptable. I know that staffing for next year isn't finalized and the school administration is actively engaged with Ms. Miller and Ms. Byers, but principals should not have to fight for that valued, their critical staff position like that year after year. Our children cannot learn if they feel unsafe, uncomfortable or are in crisis. Behavior interventionists along with school counselors and school social workers are vital to our students' success in school. In addition to ensuring that there are two behavior interventionists, Pleasant Plains size and demographics necessitate two full-time counselors and a full-time social worker. I urge you to reconsider the level of social emotional support in our schools and in Pleasant Plains in particular. For the last several years, BCPS's enrollment projections have been way off target. Pleasant Plains, like many area schools, is overcrowded and has been for some time. Our zone does not see a lot of new development. What we are seeing, specifically in the Lock Raven Village neighborhood inside the Pleasant Plains boundary, is turnover. Original owners are sadly passing away or moving on, and young families are moving in. There needs to be some way to account for changing demographics in neighborhoods besides looking at new development. Doing so would allow BCPS to be proactive and hopefully avoid significant overcrowding at so many schools. I also ask that you keep Pleasant Plains in mind as you consider capital improvement projects at BCPS. We will need adequate space to accommodate the staff our students need. This current space is undersized for the students that Pleasant Plains serves. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker for this evening is Kevin Leary. Good evening. Good evening. I hope you all are having a good week. I'm here tonight on behalf of the community. I am uh, active in Perry Hall and uh, on, in a number of community groups that have to do with education. And uh, what I want to talk about tonight is some of the problems that we're facing. I want to echo that I am very disappointed in the uh, budget process that went through last month. And um, it's not how it should have went. Um, there, there are many ways that we could cut that budget to make it more presentable and easily funded um, and not by cutting curriculum and teacher salaries and whatever else was put up there. Um, there are a lot of wasteful spending going on in, in the county, not just in the school board, but in the county in general that needs to be cut. Um, I, I understand we are looking for a super, a permanent superintendent. And whether that be Ms. White or somebody else, the person that comes in and everybody sitting here on this board cannot look back at the people that were here before us and blame them for the situation that we are in right now. We cannot do that. We have to grab a hold of this situation and fix it. As community leaders, it's our job to do that. I Googled before I got here today, what makes a good leader? And according to Google, a great leader possesses clear vision, is courageous, has integrity, honesty, humility, and clear focus. Great leaders help people reach their goals, are not afraid to hire people that might be better than them, and take pride in the accomplishments of those they help along the way. I would hope that whoever it is that we choose to pick 
and to be our next superintendent follows that path. And also, that's, I come from a military background, and um, a great leader to me is somebody who would not ask the people that are out there in the trenches to do something that they would not do or wouldn't be willing to do themselves. We can't balance our budget on the backs of these students and teachers who are out there fighting and trying to make our community better. We have to take care of them. They are the backbone of this whole situation and we cannot just leave them out and not do what we need to do for them. Everything needs to be taken care of. We need to do it the right and proper way. And, and I am here to help in any way I can. Most of the board has my direct phone number. You can call me. Thank you. Thank you. And our next speaker for the evening is Mr. Tom Lonegro. Chairwoman Causey, uh, Superintendent White, and other board members, uh, thanks for having me tonight. Uh, I want to comment today on the Costanza boundary study as it relates to the Hunt Cup Hill Shawan Valley school attendance area issue. On the agenda for this evening's meeting is the final review and acceptance of the Costanza Boundary Study recommendations. As you know, the Costanza development is straddled by two existing school attendance areas. The study was initiated from concerns that this split would not deliver an effective use of Baltimore County Public School resources and would have a negative impact on community continuity. The study's uh, resulting recommendation is to align the school attendance area boundaries so that all the homes are within a single school attendance area. We agree with the study objectives and we think that's a good recommendation. As I discussed at the previous school board meeting, the Hunt Cup Hill Shawan Valley community has the same situation. The school attendance areas divide the community between two elementary schools. Our experience has shown that the objectives that it stands to study are correct, that having a community split between two school areas is detrimental to community continuity and cohesion, and results in not a very uh, useful way of distributing Baltimore County school resources. At that meeting, uh, Chairman Clausey asked Dr. Russell Brown of the Division of Research, Accountability, and, and Assessments to follow up on our concerns. Uh, we thank Chairman Clausey for that. Since then, we have provided Dr. Brown with a uh, recent Hunt Cup Hill Community Residence Survey and other additional background to support our issues. Dr. Brown has told me he has that information and is reviewing it. At this point, we would like to ask that the school board formalize this effort and apply the same criteria, uh, criteria and processing that was done for the Costanza Boundary Study to bring the Hunt Cup Hill Shawan Valley boundary issue to a satisfactory uh, conclusion also. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker this evening is Dr. Bosch Farone. Good evening. Good evening to all. Sorry, my voice is a little bit a uh, problem. Um, I really recognize the difficulties you were facing with the budget last meeting. And I really appreciate the effort that you have done. Um, hopefully, you can improve on that. Our strength as a nation is really obvious. We are the strongest, not only in this earth, but probably in this universe. We will never be overcome by enemy missiles, but we can be overcome if we allow our public education to be weakened. Um, weakening special education, weakening curriculum, um, allowing poor discipline, allowing inequity as we have, allowing discrimination as we have, allowing some wasteful, wasteful activities that we have in our system. Example of waste is the closure of the school system for 24 years on two religious minority non-Komar holidays without a secular reason. As I sent to you by email a couple of weeks ago, there has never been a secular reason at the time of Dr. Berger, time of Dr. Hirston, time of Dr. Dance, and today the same thing in the 2019-2020 proposed calendar. As you know, 
the school system has already existing policies that any student or teacher or employee can take off without being asked on their religious holidays. And if they don't have a belief, they can take off for that reason too. No question is asked. And as you know, in the past 25 years, there has been a seismic change in the composition of Baltimore County. We are no longer one color on one religion, not even two colors and two religions. So for me, this pretend that this calendar has a secular reason for the closure on the two non-Komar holidays is really, it's a hypocrisy. It, it's really a discrimination of that, uh, about others, and it really represents the anti-Islamism both in our local politics here and nationwide. I ask you to change that. You can't blame it on others. You really cannot blame it on Dr. Berger. You cannot blame it on Hairston. You cannot blame it on Dance. You cannot even blame it on our interim superintendent. You, the board, can do that. Equal must be equal. Ramadan needs to Thank you. And our final speaker, our final speaker for this evening is Colleen Baldwin. Good evening. Hi, good evening. <coughs> Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chair Hen, Superintendent White, and members of the board. My name is Colleen Baldwin. I am the PTA Vice President for Pleasant Plains Elementary, the parent of a second grader and future Panther, and a proud BCPS spouse. Over the last few months, you've heard me and other community members speak about the level of overcrowding at Pleasant Plains in the context of what we know to be significant capacity concerns across the county. At this rate, the other Colleen and I may need to get Wonder Twins or Thing One and Thing Two costumes as we come to these meetings to speak with you. I'm here to once again implore you to consider us among those in desperate need of more permanent space and to ask those in a position to make such decisions to put Pleasant Plains on the table for renovation and expansion. According to the 2018 Student Counts Report, Pleasant Plains is, by percentage, the most overcrowded school in the central area and the fourth most, crowded, most overcrowded school in the county. Based on September 30th enrollment, we were at 131% of state rated capacity, making us the only central area school to fall in that red shading key of over 130%. From a size perspective, only seven elementary schools in the central area have higher state-rated capacities than Pleasant Plains, and only three of those are slightly overcrowded, falling in the 100 to 115% range. While I don't have current enrollment data for those same schools, as of today, I can tell you that we remain above 700 students, pushing our capacity numbers from 131% in September to 138% today. In that same report, aggregate numbers for the central area indicate that elementary school capacity is just shy of 100%. While it is common for aggregate data to inform a macro level view of things, with an asterisk given to potential outliers, I would argue that considering Pleasant Plains or any overcrowded school as an asterisk does a grave disservice to our community and puts students and staff at risk. We recognize that decision making for school capacity issues does not occur in a vacuum. Planning and execution phases take time and budget considerations are on everyone's minds. It is because of these factors that Pleasant Plains should have already been in the mix for capital improvements, but we're nowhere near that being a reality. Our numbers continue to climb and our day-to-day -day experience tells us that is not going to change. While we have some short-term fixes on the table, such as additional relocatables, one or two more trailers with no long-term plan on the horizon does little to foster an equitable learning environment. We are willing to partner with any and all stakeholders to get things moving, and the time to act was yesterday because a healthier learning environment at Pleasant Plains adds value to the central area and the greater community. Thank you. Thank you.
Our next agenda item is item number F, superintendent's report. And for that, I ask call on Ms. White. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good evening to all of our board members and to the public as well. It is my pleasure to begin tonight by recognize, recognizing our very own student member of the board, Halima Adekoya, who was recently named and will be named as Baltimore County's uh, Young Woman of the Year. We are very, very proud of you. a well-deserved honor. I also wanted to take this opportunity to update the board and the, and the public on a recent community questions we heard a few here tonight uh, related to transportation. So first, to provide some context, Baltimore County Public Schools transports 84,000 students daily via 808 buses and bus routes um, traveling in excess of 600 square miles. We have received specific stakeholder information from the Northeast area, specifically the Perry Hall area, which is served by two bus lots, uh, Kenwood and Rosedale, and supported by additional contracted routes. Uh, transportation staff in the Northeast area support 175 bus routes and approximately 18,000 students. However, we are aware that approximately five to six of the 175 um, bus routes in the, specifically in the Perry Hall in the Kingsville area have experienced some lateness in the morning and in the afternoon over the past two weeks. And so I just wanted to give a little bit of an update. We know that, again, uh, getting schools uh, home, getting, schools to, getting students to school on time, getting them home on time is of paramount uh, concern, not only to parents, but to staff and to the community as well. So we want to make sure that we are doing that and that we're making good on our promise. But to address the unusual number of absences due to a variety of reasons, which include illnesses and weather-related absences and issues and various vacancies, we are reassigning resources from other areas, both internal and external, to further support tran the transportation of students in these areas and these impacted areas, and we are doing that in the immediate. In addition, staff from the Office of Transportation and the School Support Office are coordinating efforts to ensure the consistent use of school-to-home communication. Um, so again, it's not that the communication wasn't always there, but it's that we've been inconsistent in how we're communicating. So we want to make sure that we're using school and that we're using school messenger as a consistent means of communication uh, to parents to keep them updated as, as far as their child's bus route. And we are contracting it's at more using more contracted um, bus drivers and bus routes as well so that we can make sure that we are addressing some of those uh, routes where th we see that there are shortages, of specifically those five or six that are impacting um, Perry Hall in the Kingsville area. Again, it is crucial that every child gets to school on time every day and we will continue to monitor our service in this area daily. Uh, we hope that the weather will cooperate, and we also hope that spring is on the way at some point in time. And so thankfully, when it comes to weather, thankfully weather did not interrupt our Read Across America Day, which was last Saturday. I saw many of you there. I see Ms. Baden shaking uh, her head, nodding her head. Um, I had the opportunity to serve as a guest reader at Towson Town Center. It was truly a pleasure to see the children appreciating uh, story time at the mall. So thank you to Tabco for hosting such a wonderful event that supports literacy as well. What is even better is that our schools uh, celebrated Read Across America all throughout last week. Um, we had older students reading to the younger students. Uh, classrooms welcomed guest readers from the community um, or from other adults in the building. There were book buddies and hallway readings and read aloud and author visits, and it was just a really good time, again, to celebrate literacy all throughout Baltimore County. And so I'm really proud of that literacy work that's getting done in our school system. Remember, and you know, I know that I sound like a broken record here, but literacy really is the foundation of every, uh, everything that we do and the foundation of every other subject area. So we are really proud of these literacy-rich environments that are being cultivated in our schools. Uh, to fuel our students' learning, 
We know that healthy meals are essential for our students' success. As we celebrate National School Breakfast Week, I want to acknowledge that our schools serve 32,000 breakfasts daily. Uh, for a total of 577,000 breakfasts this school year. That's a lot of breakfast. Uh, through Baltimore County Cares for Kids, through our new program and our new initiative that we implemented this year, we have offered 82,500 of these meals at no cost for students who qualify for reduced priced meals. And so we're really proud of that. I would like to thank our food and nutrition services staff in our schools and in our central offices who ensured that students are fed healthy meals every single uh, school day. As a reminder to the public and to staff as well, tomorrow is the last day to take our stakeholder survey. Many of you have already provided helpful guidance for the future of our ed educational programming by taking the survey. So I hope that you will all take advantage of the stake stakeholder survey. Uh, we want all of our students in grades three through 12, as well as all of our parents, staff, and community members to please take the survey by tomorrow. Just go to uh, www.bc.org cps.org it'll be right there on the splash pa page it takes five minutes and you can help give us that critical information that we need moving forward I mentioned that the stakeholder survey is one source of guidance for our school system over and over we've heard about the value of our human resources such as our school social workers because of the invaluable work that they do to support the whole child as well as helping families with everything from basic needs to parent workshops and so i would like to wish our staff our social workers a very happy national school social worker week so thanks to all of our school social workers Madam Chair, that is my report. Thank you. And the next item is the Chair's report. So for that, I have a lot of things to cover, so I'm going to try and be quick because we do want to progress in our agenda. Um, it has been just about 90 days for this board uh, to be sworn in and jump in to the work of the board. And I've got to say that we've been very busy, very productive, and that it's been encouraging. We're not perfect, but we are improving. I can see that uh, with each meeting that we attend, whether it's a committee meeting or a full board meeting, whether it's attending school visits or school events uh, or community events. Um, one thing is clear, we do have an executive assistant that I want to point out who is working incredibly hard to facilitate the work of all 12 board members, eight who've just come in three months. One aspect of the board that I'm really proud of is how they've jumped into training that's available uh, through MABE and other avenues. We held a board retreat, and then board members have taken it upon themselves to attend more and additional training. We've uh, gotten through processing and also approving the county capital budget request, which was over $300 million this year. We've approved a math program audit by Johns Hopkins to evaluate curriculum and instruction for areas of improvement. <coughs> We've worked through the operating budget, $1.7 billion. Now, the budget work is not done. The budget work continues. And the reason for that is this is a document that's on our website, and it talks about the historic um, asks that have been made and then what was the uh, budget that was adopted with the percentages proposed over MOE, which is maintenance of effort, and then what was adopted over maintenance of effort. So. We can see that this year our ask was 11% and the board increased that, so it's, it's over that. And, um, but historically, we haven't received what we've asked for. So to that end, the uh, interim superintendent and her staff are continuing the work, and the Board of Education is implementing something new this year. We're cre I've created an ad hoc budget committee, and uh, we'll have members on that. They will receive input from all board members uh, who can uh, submit questions and comments and suggestions. We also have two of our board's senior auditors from our Board of Education Office of Internal Audit that will support that ad hoc committee. Also, Ms. White has designated staff from her Office of Fiscal Services to support the work. Um, and so we appreciate being able to coordinate efforts and, not, and also to prevent duplicative efforts. Uh, there's many goals in there, including increasing all board members' understanding of the board proposed operating budget, 
um, also to continue evaluating the operating budget to prioritize funding in support of personnel and programs that are providing positive impact on student safety and academic achievement. Also to identify any areas of uh, possible savings and uh, possible budget efficiencies. So they're going to just do work of gathering uh, questions and comments from board members, uh, receiving information from uh, the staff, and then uh, doing analysis in order to prepare budget adjustment recommendations to the full board based on funding level information that we'll be receiving from the county executive and his budget team. So that's an ongoing effort. Certainly anyone that has input can email um, boe at bcps.org and we will receive your input. Um, additional work that's been done in the first uh, 90 days is we have a number of standing committees uh, where we have been doing a lot of work, curriculum, buildings and contracts, but also we are staffing to um, an additional um, committee, the Baltimore County Anti-Bullying Task Force was created by the legislature, and I'm pleased to announce that Lily Rowe has volunteered to be the chair of that committee, and also student member uh, Halimi, Halima Adekoya is going to be on that committee. So we look forward to the work in that regard. Also, Career and Technology Advisory Council, we have Mr. Offerman, who's volunteered to be the liaison with that. So there's additional work that we have been doing, and I look forward to um, all of the work that will continue to be done. That does bring up an issue that people have talked about. Um, I understand from board members they're getting questions. We've heard comments tonight. And the board did, in fact, receive a report uh, this th earlier this evening. And here's what I can tell you. It is a confidential draft audit report. It is not available for the public due to standard auditing practices. Um, the work on it, it continues, and as soon as it is in final format, it will be released to the public. So we appreciate your patience while that work is done in the fashion that the external auditor and his professional expertise requires. Uh, the next issue I wanted to address is transportation. I appreciate, appreciate Ms. White giving us that update. Also, there'll be two board members meeting with staff to receive a, a additional information and also to understand uh, how things are going to be improved moving forward, both short term, as she's pointed out, and in the long term. Um, it was very significant to wrap up Black History Month with the NAACP Community Forum that was already referenced earlier. We had a number of board members attend and we had four members be panelists. So that was very uh, appropriate and it was very well attended. So we look forward to receiving additional questions from that group which we'll be answering and continued engagement so that we can support the students. Uh, also, another issue of great interest is superintendent search, and I, we all appreciate the interest of the community in the superintendent search, and we're all encouraged by it. We understand that finding the best leader for our school system is of vital importance. We want to hear from the public and from constituent groups and have built in various avenues for input, and you'll be hearing more about that later on in agenda item O. But rest assured, as the process continues, we will consider community input. At the same time, in order to get the most qualified pool of candidates we can find, it is essential that identities of those applying for the position remain confidential, so their current positions are not jeopardized, and so they can be fully and fairly vetted by our search firm. These confidentiality concerns will require, and Maryland law allows, that portions of the decision-making process be completed outside of public view. During those times, we as a board will remain open to community input. However, it will be inappropriate for us to comment on or lobby for or against any individual candidates during that search process. We will strive to keep the community informed of all stages in the process and decisions made when possible. In reaching our ultimate decision, we'll be mindful of the background, strengths, and experience of the candidates who apply and will let the process guide us to make the best judgment possible. As I mentioned, there'll be more information discussed about the community input processes um, that are being recommended later this evening. And just to end, I wanted to end on a point that our uh, student member of the board pointed out the other day, is that it will be so great because we are dealing with children to show more love. And sometimes people show love in different ways. 
And I just appreciate the fact of all the board members that are here showing love for individual children, for the school system as a whole, and for our county by sacrificing their time, time with their family, time with their careers, in order to do this work. Sometimes it's going to be messy, but ultimately the intentions are good and the work that results will also be good. So while this is <laughs> maybe different to say, we do love you. We love the students, we love the teachers, we love our community, and we really want you to know that we care. And that is the end of my report. Thank you. Excuse me. That brings us to the next item, student board members report. Ms. Adekoya. Good evening, everyone. Happy Tuesday. About three weeks ago, we had our operating budget board meeting, where we passed the operating budget with a plethora of added amendments. As I stated when amendments were initially being made, I am truly disappointed that the budget passed with cuts to curriculum with no thought as to what will be impacted moving forward. We built our budget requests on asking for what we wanted and eventually needed, but at the end of the day, disregarded the students and their needs when making budget modifications. But moving forward, though, I am very happy to announce that my second episode of Hanging with the Lima is now out. This episode highlights Eastern Tech Girls Who Code Club, spearheaded by Mary and Ume, who were charged with the idea of creating a space for women where they can build their confidence and skills in computer science. They are slowly but surely changing the way the students, especially women at Eastern Tech, see the way changing the way they look at computer science and their involvement in the technology world. Thank you BCPS TV for filming and production and also Eastern Tech for allowing me to come and showcase their girls who rock. Make sure to check out the video on Vimeo and if you would like for me to highlight your school's fabulous club, please email me at hadekoya at bcps.org. Also be on the lookout for a new episode of Chat Cafe coming out this month. I cannot wait to get in the studio with students discussing real topics that affect our day-to-day -day lives, sharing our Insight and also informing the world around us on what it is. If you are a student interested in being on the show, please let me know. I'd love to have you. And of course, if you have not checked out our last episodes, what are you waiting for? Make sure to check it out today on BCPS TV Vimeo. At the last curriculum meeting last week, Excitement was at the root of all the new and updated curriculum materials soon to be coming forward to the full board tonight as contracts. Students, we have new interactive core materials coming down the pipeline soon. I even took one home. Thank you, Mr. Billingsley. <laughs> so with that being said, here's some encouragement for all the students. Just keep swimming, just keep swimming. We are halfway through third quarter, so please keep going. Please keep attending your classes. Please keep paying attention. Please keep being top being on top of all is required of you in school. Keep being alert and giving your teachers and adults the utmost respect that they deserve. Please keep staying alert and aware of what is occurring around you, whether it's in your schoolhouse or on the board level. Attend board meetings and please, by all means, watch online if you cannot attend. As I am the most informed student, you too can be as well. Get involved in your school community and outside community. Be the change you want to see. See it, say it. Ask for what you need to truly be successful and hold us accountable to make sure you receive it. Remember, your student voice is the principle for changing our world. That help you need, I promise, is available. Seek the resources you need. Do not be afraid. I believe in you. I am here for you. Yes, every 114,000 student. Hey, sis. Hey, bro. I, have, I am nothing but an email away. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us to our next agenda item I, unfinished business, Castanea Community Focus Boundary. Um, I'm going to ask Dr. Brown to come forward to uh, present the proposed Castanea Community Focus Boundary change. By way of background, on February 5th, 2019, the Board of Education of Baltimore County received for consideration and approved a report from the Castanea State's Community Boundary Study Committee recommending boundary changes to schools to align attendance areas for this development. The recommendation, known as Scenario A, affects the boundaries of Mays Chapel and Fort Garrison Elementary Schools, Pikesville and Ridgely Middle Schools, and Delaney and Pikesville High Schools. The board held a public hearing on the recommended boundary change on February 21st at Mays Chapel Elementary School. No person signed up to speak. All of the supporting documentation, meeting materials, and scenarios are available on the Castanea Boundary Study webpage. Dr. Brown? 
Good evening, uh, Good members evening. of the board, Superintendent White, uh, members of the community. Um, I'm here to ask that the board adopt scenario A as recommended by the Boundary Committee uh, to the Board of Education. Uh, this is the culmination of a process that began last June. Um, the committee worked through uh, the, the fall of this year and the recommendation, uh, as Ms. Causey put forward to you, came uh, in February of this year. And um, it's a rather uh, confined boundary uh, that uh, addresses a uh, development that was non-residential that is now residential and aligns the boundaries so that the students in that uh, new residential area will have the opportunity to attend schools in the Duane E. Feeder pattern. Do I have a motion to approve scenario A of the proposed Castanea community focus boundary? Mr. Kuhn? Mr. Kuhn? I'll, I'll motion. It, thank you. Do I have a second? second? Does anyone have any questions or comments? I do want to say thank you to your group and the team for all of the work that went into it. Um, all in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us to item J, unfinished business, the proposed 2019-2020 school calendar. And for that, I will ask Dr. Mayo to come forward to present the proposed calendar. Following the presentation, we'll allow time for discussion if the board so desires. Good evening, Dr. Mayo, Mr. Good Duke. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Superintendent White, members of the board. Um, as Ms. Causey just mentioned, we're here to uh, follow up on our discussion from the last meeting in regards to the proposed calendar for the 2019-2020 school year. Um, we are asking for your approval um, to move forward or consideration to move forward with the recommendation from the last board meeting and as stated at the last board meeting um, in the event this is approved tonight then it would be submitted to the state board for consideration um, before we can actually do any type of publishing of the calendar for the 1920 school year thank you board members questions or comments Ms. Rowe? So I have heard Mr. Boschferon, Dr. Boschferon, come here for the last however many years my kids have been in school, seven, seven years. And he's come to every single meeting and asked about the Muslim holidays. And I would like to know if it is our intention in future calendars to make the Muslim holidays, which my understanding is don't always even fall during the school year, professional development days as well. That's already in place. That's already in place. So, okay, so we're treating those holidays equally then? That's correct. Thank you. Are there other questions or comments on the proposed calendar? Ms. Scott? Thank you. Um, my question is, and I'm looking at the proposed calendar, it says BCPS directed closures seven days and then public school holidays. Could you just say the difference? Because uh, I see uh, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur on the uh, BCPS directed closures and then um, where it says public school holidays, just the, the difference between the two. Thank you. It's on um, page seven, it looks like, of the PowerPoint presentation. This, is this the PowerPoint? I'm, I know it's kind of small to see. Yes. This is the one, okay. That is it, okay. So what is your question, Ms. Scott? <laughs> my glass. What's the difference between those two, John? Yeah. The public school holidays are state mandated holidays, um, whereas the top portion where you see BCPS directed closures are closures that Baltimore County has decided to close schools. So the bottom portion are state mandated, and that's why I mentioned if this calendar is approved, we would have to actually take it to the state board simply because we are asking for two of those days that are considered public school holidays to be used as our inclement weather days. Okay, and, and did you tell Ms. Rowe that the Muslim holiday was on there, or did I mishear that? Next year, it would not be on there. I believe, um, I believe it's on a, during the summer or either on the weekend next. And we're next speaking year. of, was it Ramadan? 
Ramadan. No, not Ramadan. Oh. It would be one of the Eids, either Eid al-Fitr or Eid al-Adha. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Kuhn. Uh, so I see one of the BCPS uh, directed closures for the MSCA conference day. Is that a, um, a negotiated day, uh, day that we decide to close uh, because of t union representation? I'm just trying to understand the selection of that day to close. It's, it's not a negotiated, um, it's not in our master agreement, it's just been an okay. understanding simply because we have a lot of our teachers who actually go to the conference for professional development would have a large number of staff members out um, if that was the case. All right, so that's why you. it is a professional development day for teachers on that day, student thank holiday. Thank you. Ms. Adekoya? Um, just for clarification purposes, so as of next school year when the calendar is being made, Eid um, will be considered as a date, as a BCPS directed closure? No, okay. Eid is on the weekend or either during the summer. I, I don't remember the exact dates okay. um, for the 19, 20 school year, how the eats are falling. Good information. In the 1920 school year, it, I believe it falls on a weekend. For uh, whenever, the, whenever the committee meets, and if the, one of the eats falls on a weekday, then we take into consideration the recommendations of the board, which is to, if at all possible, make it a professional development day. So this is made um, on a school year by school year basis. So Correct. eventually every school year you will consider. Correct. Great. Thank you. Are there other questions or comments? Do I have a motion to approve the proposed 2019-2020 school calendar? Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Do I have a second? Thank you, Ms. Hen. All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Duke. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. And just for clarification, Eat Our Fitter is actually on May 24th, which is a Sunday for the 1920 school year. Thank you for that clarification. That's right, I'm still here, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I would like board consent for the following personnel matters. Termination, retirements, resignations, leaves of absence, and certificated appointments. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits K-1 through K-5? Thank you, Ms. Mack. Is there a second? Mr. Offerman, thank you. All in favor, please raise your, oh, excuse me, is there any discussion? Okay, all in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. That brings us to our next item, item L, new business, administrative appointments. For that, I call on Ms. White. Thank you, Madam Chair. And before they all just leave out of the room, why don't we give our Boy Scouts a round of applause? <laughs> Appreciate them for learning about their civil service. So um, thank you for attending tonight's board meeting. Madam Chair and members of the board, I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. ESOL Specialist Office of ESOL and World Languages, Specialist Office of Special Education, Teaching and Learning, and Specialist Office of ESOL and World Languages. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit L1? So moved. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Do I have a second? Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The motion carries. Our next item. Oh, I just need oh, to recognize. Excuse them. me, <laughs> Ms. White. So, uh, congratulations to the following individuals. I know that we have one person who's able to make it tonight, and two who are not able to make it, but we still would like to recognize them. First, we'd like to ask Alicia Freeman to please stand with any free, um, family members that you might have. Congratulations, Ms. Freeman. <laughs> 
Freeman will be our new ESOL specialist in the Office of ESOL and World, ESOL and World Languages. Ms. Freeman, do you have any friends or family here with you this evening? Oh, well, congratulations. <laughs> I'd also like to recognize, although they're not here tonight, uh, Kelly Loretta, who will be the new specialist in the Office of Special Education in the area of teaching and learning, and also Catherine Riley, who will be the new specialist in the Office of ESOL and World Languages. So congratulations to them as well. Thank you. Our next item is item M, new business. Action taken in closed session. And for that, I call forward Mr. Nussbaum. Actually, there was none. <laughs> Wonderful. We're catching up. <laughs> Our next item is item N, new business, contract awards. For that, I call forward Mr. Smith, Mr. Sar Saris, and Mr. Dixit. Whoa. And I turn it over to Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the board, the board's building and contracts committee met earlier this evening. Items N1 through N4, items N6 through N12, and items N14 through N26 are being forwarded to the full board for approval. At the request of staff, item N13 was withdrawn, and item N5 is being forwarded with a recommendation that this contract be referred to the curriculum committee for further consideration. Before we vote, did any board members want any contract items out separately to either ask questions about or have considered separately? Ms. Adekoya. Aside from five. The committee uh, set that out separately. Ms. Rowe. The reading curriculum one, we're going to do that separate or when we vote, are we voting on the whole list you just said? Items N1 through 4, N6 through 12, and N14 through N26 are being forwarded um, to the full board for approval. So item N5 was, with, was removed. But we'll discuss that. Yes. Okay, thank you. And N13 was withdrawn by staff. Do I have a motion to approve items N1 through 4? N1 through N4. N6 through N12. N6 through N12. And N14 through N26. N14 through N26. Second. Thank you. No second is needed since a recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion on any of that, those contracts? Hearing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The motion carries. You can proceed. Thank you. Item N5, the committee voted this evening to recommend um, that we refer that contract to the curriculum committee for a recommendation before taking action. Um, we can uh, have discussion on that issue now. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would just um, ask the board's consideration in approving, approving this uh, contract. Again, this is for the purchase of books. And so we just want to make sure that our, um, our classrooms are outfitted with the uh, level text and the in independent reading materials that they um, are seeking to purchase. And so um, I would just ask Ms. Shea to give just a general overview for the board's consideration as you're making this decision. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, so this contract is exactly that. It's to purchase books. And teachers in classrooms and students in classrooms use books for a variety of reasons. So sometimes we have classroom libraries just purely for student choice. We want to encourage our kids, as the superintendent mentioned before, in our celebrations of literacy. Some of our celebrations involve reading books that you like, that are of interest, that reflect what we call windows and mirrors, so that you can learn about um, kids that look like you, but also of cultures around the world. So that's one type of text that would be covered under this. Another is the idea of decodable text. You've heard a lot. You heard earlier this evening from CCAC. We talked a lot last night about all of our efforts to increase our instruction around um, structured literacy, phonemic awareness, phonics, especially for students with dyslexia. Students who are receiving explicit instruction in phonics also need time to practice. They need an opportunity to practice in decodable text. That type of text would be covered under this contract. It also would provide the opportunity for 
for schools to buy leveled materials so that when teachers are working with small groups of students, they can flood the room with books at a variety of levels on different topics and themes that they're using for the purposes of instruction. And lastly, it also allows our curricular offices. We are increasing our efforts to do some transdisciplinary um, instruction and curriculum, which is really exciting. We can engage students through science and social studies and nonfiction text. So this contract would also allow some of our curricular offices to purchase texts to support that type of instruction. So um, as the superintendent said, our goal is to flood these classrooms with lots of different texts for lots of different purposes. And that's what this contract is really about. Thank you. Um, Ms. Mack. Um, my concern about this is, now that I've had time to actually look at it, is that there's little evidence that um, guided reading is effective in addressing um, reading problems in children and um, improving student achievement. And it's my understanding that this is um, Fontes and Pinnell. That's incorrect. The mention of Fontes and Pinnell is that is one leveling system. This is not about a program. This is not about a particular approach. What the contract language says is that all these different books are aligned to a lot of different leveling systems, one of which does include the Fontes and Pinnell leveling system. This has nothing to do with an instructional approach. I would um, push back about the research. Um, what you talked about in terms of guided reading is not an effective approach for students with dyslexia, for example. Um, that part is true. But this contract is not about a particular approach. The language Fontes and Pinnell is just describing one system of leveling books. It also mentions lexile levels, grade levels, levels, and we would also use it for decodable text, which is not on any level. It's actually pre-leveled. My other concern about this is committing this amount of money. I know that we have um, a trial right now or um, going on with open court, and I think it would be, um, we would not be doing due diligence as a board until we hear how effective that trial has been um, before we approve this. So if I may, these funds are um, that we are in particular seeking are not the same for, those are two different purposes. In other words, the open court program um, and the pilot that we are excited about is about a core program for phonics and phonemic awareness, structured literacy instruction for all students. This again is, is truly just about purchasing books. We currently have multiple grant, um, grant sources that we wish to use for the purposes of this um, contract including we have um, a Title IV grant that we currently have um, just in this year alone, $275,000 earmarked, specifically for that cross-curricular purpose that I talked about before in which it would be necessary to purchase books for students to read around different topics in science and social studies. We also have, you, um, this board has heard me talk about the Striving Readers Comprehensive Literacy or what we call the Circle Grant. Within that grant, we have a total of $700,000 earmarked for the purpose over the next um, well, it's in one fiscal year, two years of the grant, to purchase books. Um, and then in Title I funds, I reached out after we had a similar question um, earlier today to talk with Title I. And last year, our schools used Title I funds to purchase texts um, at a, a rate of $220,000. So this is a need, our schools are telling us. I also agree we need a core phonics program, which is why it was in our budget request and why we're so passionate about the curriculum and instruction portion of that budget um, because we do need a core resource. But this is not that. And the funds that I just described can't be used. I can't use the circle grant funds that I earmarked or that I described because it's not enough money for open court. Thank you. Sure. Ms. Joes had her hand up and then Ms. Pasture. Thank you. Um, so is this entirely funded by grants? I um, not necessarily. So I, I just also want to reiterate, the $6 million is our estimation of the potential spend authority over the duration. I just identified uh, over a million dollars that we have in grant funds this year. So this would allow schools to also sometimes use operating budget funds and some of the curricular offices. So we do have some operating funds where we might purchase, for example, in the ELA office or the social studies office. Um, may purchase additional texts for schools in support of curriculum. So that would come potentially from operating funds. 
Thank you, Michelle. I also have to say you explain everything very eloquently, so thank you. Thank you. I'm a teacher. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Ms. Pasteur. Yes. Uh, help me with this, Ms. Shetty. Just to make sure I'm clear that what we see here is a blend of things because no matter what level of class we have, whether it's GT, whether it's honors, whatever, that within those classes we're going to find young people who are at different levels. Okay, yes, I'm going to layer this. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. That means that when we look at um, the materials that are here, we are in many ways assessing and helping young people in a classroom, and I'm just going to speak in a classroom, who are at different levels so that they will have um, a, a variety of things to read so that they stay engaged throughout the lesson regardless of their level. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Also, what we're doing here, because we're dealing with language, arts, science, social studies, we have an opportunity in the reading to do something that we haven't always done, and that means that we are crossing the content areas. So we're making sure that children have opportunities on whatever level they happen to be to do some reading outside of what is the norm in terms of the textbook for those particular classes. Am I correct here. You are absolutely correct. Okay. So we are um, uh, doing things here that are going to also examine where the children are, not just buying materials and having them in there, but so that the teacher can look at Ms. Shea and say, let me show you the materials that I think are going to help you. Let's look at Mr. Kuhn and let's see, because you're a little different in your learning style and your needs. Is that correct? Yes, so this would allow teachers to have books at lots of different levels, representing lots of different genres, mm -hmm. fiction, nonfiction, um, et cetera. So as an example, many of you saw, I know in schools you visited, or on Twitter perhaps, or social media, um, we recently had many of our students participate in a um, Hidden Figures presentation where students had an opportunity to research, and many of you are nodding and smiling, a lot of famous African Americans and their contributions as part of black history, but also to your point, that cross connection between social studies and ELA. Mm -hmm. This allows classrooms to have biographies of lots of different African Americans at lots of different levels so that students have an opportunity to choose one that they are passionate or interested about and have a plethora of text mm -hmm. to do that type of research and have that authentic engagement in those types of instructional um, opportunities. And help me with this because you're a, a reading teacher, correct? Mm -hmm. All right, so how we process um, um, the literacy or how we use it, when we're looking at nonfiction, our skills are different than when we are looking at fiction. Is that, that correct? That is absolutely correct. So we have that blend here as well. We sure do. And then I will just finish because I know that as we talk about STAT, one of the issues is <laughs> in, in not having so much screen time. So this offers those people who want less screen time and have our children in books, it gives them the books they need. This is all about book love. When we talk about lots of different ways to Thank show you. love, that's what this is. All right, book love. I you love got it. it. Thank you. Okay, I have Miss Adekoya and then Miss White would like to comment. Thank you. I love Miss Pasteur so much. But <laughs> basically, long story short, our children need some books. Yes, ma'am. And you need us to vote on this to get some books into our classrooms. Our students and teachers would greatly appreciate it. Yes. All right. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Miss mm -hmm. White. Okay, so I would just ask the board's consideration. I'm just going to zoom out a bit. I, I mentioned this before when it came to audits in terms of um, the system evaluating itself or um, having others evaluate us. It came up during the math audit discussion. And I know that as the board is trying to find its way and trying to um, gel, that, would, that kind of information would be important to us as staff. Again, many times there we are questioned about our digital resources, right? And whether or not um, we should go that way toward digital resources. And now tonight, we're, we're feeling some pushback when it comes to print resources and books. 
Um, I don't think that this is an either or conversation for our teachers. I think that our teachers need to have both in terms of making sure that they have the resources they need to meet the varying levels um, that we've discussed here tonight. It is about the interdisciplinary approach uh, to content. It is also about making sure that we're reaching students on their various levels, but it's also about those five processes of reading. You have your phonics, your phonemic awareness, your fluency, your comprehension, your vocabulary. And so for those who are experts in the field, I would ask us to defer to them and to rely on their experience and their expertise, not to question, certainly we expect the questions on the, 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 the content, we expect the questions on the terms of the contract and the conditions, but I would ask us to think about all of those various processes of reading to make sure that we are um, outfitting our classrooms with both digital and print resources so that our teachers have the have those resources in hand to be able to meet the needs of their varying learners uh, again if we're not going to use digital resources and we're not going to use print resources then what will our teachers have thank you i did just want to point out uh, i normally do this at the beginning that we had buildings and contracts committee earlier this evening and there was um, extensive conversation, um, but also I appreciate the fact that um, staff has brought forward additional information that was presented here. So um, there may be some disconnect between conversations that happened earlier and conversations that are happening now because of the additional information that you've brought forward. So I appreciate you doing that. My um, pleasure. Uh, we had Mr. McMillian and then Ms. Rowe. Ms. Shea, did I hear correct? correctly earlier in the presentation you mentioned that this money will be divided up and will go out into the schools operating budgets and, and no so okay. this contract would allow schools as they chose to use both grant funds so schools that are title one have access to title one grants um, but the reason that the funding source says grant and operating budget is because schools do also have funds in their operating budget that they have occasion for such this purpose so with the money and the operating budgets, those principals and those teachers can select their own, the books of their choice sure. yep. to meet their students' needs. Absolutely. Thanks. Ms. Rowe? So um, I don't, for the full board, I don't want to go over everything in contract but I, that we had, but I did want you to clarify one point is that I think that what happened in contracts committee is that there was some concern that because of the dollar amount and because of this contract coupled with professional development contract that this might be some sort of systemic wide curriculum commitment. And one of the questions that I asked about how this is similar to the contract we yes. had before about gym clothes, where it's kind of something schools are already doing, mm -hmm. that these are, can you just sure. re-answer that for the board? Because I think it makes it look clearer. Mm -hmm. And the, the, con, uh, the building and contracts committee just didn't want to make the decision on the financials if curriculum committee members felt that they wanted to hear this out. So we're all here, so if you sure. could explain that. Absolutely, so similar to what we discussed with the um, PE uniforms, and I'm looking at you, Mr. McMillan, because I know you had asked that question. Um, schools have been using funds for, since the dawn of time, to buy books. This is not a, a new concept, but we have not before um, had a contract to bring that all together. And the way that that supports schools is twofold. One, by having that contract in alignment with our policy and rule, it also allows us to engage in that pricing conversation. Um, but two, we were able, as the experts, to help bring to the table other sources. So for example, Lee and Lowe is a book source identified on this contract that many schools are not familiar with that specifically focuses on providing um, texts that represent student populations that are often marginalized in text. So they essentially, they um, very intentionally um, highlight texts that serve students of color and highlight them as the main character in a way that maybe some other companies may not. So we've had schools buying classroom libraries and leveled materials forever using a variety of their operating budget. Um, I know myself as an administrator at Dundalk Elementary years ago, we did this every year and my teachers thought it was Christmas in September when I would buy 
provide them more books for their classroom. This is a way for us to bring that all together, to also provide the spending authority for schools so that, for and the other example I gave in contracts committee was when Principal Banky was looking to open Honeygo Elementary School, she wanted to purchase classroom libraries for her teachers and a leveled library for her teachers to be able to use to support small group instruction. Um, we had a conversation about that I needed a contract to be able to support that so that she could move that work forward. So exactly what you described, this is something that is not a new ask. It's not a new curricular commitment. Um, we do have grant funds that have been earmarked for the purposes of buying books, um, but to support students reading independently, teachers working with small groups of students, and also to support um, last night we heard from a lot of teachers who talked about students who receive direct services, for example, in Orton-Gillingham or using what they've learned about explicit phonics, then need text that they can practice. It's just like playing an instrument or playing a sport. You need to practice, and to do that, you need a lot of books. Thank you. I have Ms. White, and then Ms. Jones, and then Ms. Scott. Uh, just a, a point of clarification as well, and I know that um, Ms. Shea has done a wonderful job of explaining it. I just wanted to add a couple of things just for general awareness. Books are not curriculum, and so I just want, and I made up that point during contracts, and I just wanted to say it again. A curriculum consists of a scope and sequence. It consists of the content, the pathways, the pacing um, uh, guides, as well as, now we have books to support curriculum, and I think sometimes those terms are used interchangeably, but they should not be. So again, we're talking about books and resources, instructional resources, to support curriculum. The same thing is true in terms of guided reading as a strategy. Um, it is not a curriculum. Guided reading is a pedagogical strategy that we use. So there's a difference between strategies and curriculum and instructional resources. We put all of those together to create a comprehensive literacy program. But in terms of those strategies, I think we're mixing terms. And I just wanted to give the board that general understanding so that you can make an informed decision. Thank you. Ms. Jones? Thank you, Ms. White for that wonderful explanation. I just was going to comment. My daughter attends Miss Benke School, and they have some wonderful libraries. Yes. She brings in <laughs> two books every Monday, and we read through them. So I think it's a Excellent. wonderful program. Thank you. Thank you. Miss Scott? Yes, and thank you so much for your explanation and, and explaining everything to us. Um, I was just curious. I wanted to know if you could explain the benefit that this has for the children, the impact when uh, a child who is marginalized and does not see themselves a lot of times in books or or anywhere on digital screens or anything, what that means when they can read um, something that's reflective of either their ethnicity, their culture, or something like that. Thank you so much. So um, the impact is incredible in, for our students. Um, I mentioned before a phrase, windows and mirror, and I'm quoting Rudine Sims Bishop, um, who's a famous um, researcher and leader in the field of literacy, who talked about this idea of books being both windows and mirrors. And for many of our students, they've only ever had windows. They've only ever been able to see other cultures, including white culture, as the predominant. It's really important for our students of color to also have texts that are mirrors and to be able to see characters that look like them, to have um, people um, attaining wonderful um, winning awards, attaining careers, so that they can see that possibility in themselves. The level of um, interest and engagement, Ms. Pastor before um, increases dramatically when students are able to choose um, the text that they read, when they can identify that text. Um, there's nothing more proud than when a student sees themselves and, and walks around with that book cover that shows a student that looks like them. Um, we had a student last week, the teacher sent me a picture, and she said, um, this girl is wearing hijab like me. I've never seen a book where someone on the cover um, had that. That's an incredible moment and opportunity for a student um, who also then can see themselves as a reader. And that's what we want. That's why we're here, is to help all of our students have that opportunity. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd just like to, to add a point to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Ms. Scott, some point and your response. I just saw in a school that I visited something else, another dynamic, where a Caucasian child yes, looked at the, the African-American child in the class and said, she looks just like you. So it is wonderful to have that, that mirrored ex experience for yourself. 
but it is also wonderful in our society for other people to embrace and know that they are seeing another group in a book Absolutely. and doing something else. And that was such a, a wonderful moment. And they just laughed. They thought that was really cute. And the little girl did Literature look like the one in the book develops empathy, right? And we need that. We need our students to have that um, opportunity. So it, it is really powerful. And thank you for sharing that as well. I just had a quick question. Um, yes. Actually, I believe it'll be for Mr. Saris. So in our uh, contract summary sheet, it references that um, it was a new competitively bid contract and that there were 15 awardees. Um, but on the back page, it only lists five of the awardees. So I'm just curious what happened to the other ones? Yes, yeah, so uh, that's a very good point because as you'll note, this was not purchased under 7-106 as curriculum. It was a competitive bid. We received 15 bids and of those 15, we selected five vendors who uh, we felt offered the broadest variety and the best pricing and so each of the five vendors has scores of titles for each grade level. So literally there are hundreds of choices uh, represented from amongst uh, these vendors that we're recommending. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Ms. Rowe, did you have another comment? Okay, thank you. So uh, a, a couple times a year, some of the kids in my neighborhood come home from school with brand new books they've been given by the school. Like usually these are kids that are really impoverished. And is that part of this as well? Sure could be. Yep. <laughs> Ms. Jones? I would like to motion to move the previous question and vote on this. Is there, is there a second? You can raise a point of order. Okay, so the, the recommendation of the contracts, the building and contracts, was a recommendation to the board to forward this to curriculum. So we, am I correct that we either need a motion forwarding it to curriculum or a motion to approve the contract? But Ms. Cho's motion is not clear in what, which of those two things are being moved. Thank you, I'll let Ms. Hen. Correct. So there is no current motion on the floor with regards to action on the, the contract. The recommendation, the recommendation of the committee was to refer, but there was no, not a motion. We'll get you. So we had discussion first. So it would be appropriate for someone to make a motion. I, I motion that we that that we approve the contract. Second. Is there any additional? Questions or comments? Yes, I'd just like to say that what I've heard here tonight helps me be more in alignment with this than I was um, at the curriculum committee. So I appreciate the input that you provided, Ms. Shea. My pleasure. Thanks. Yes, I appreciate staff bringing additional information to the full Absolutely. board. Absolutely. Okay, may uh, all hand, excuse me, all in favor, <laughs> please raise your hand. Thank any, you. Any opposed? The motion carries. And for anyone that wants to li listen to the rest of the work of Buildings and Contracts, that video is available online. The next item is item O, new business, community input for superintendent search. This agenda item, uh, the goal is to discuss and approve community input methods and participants so that the board's executive search firm, Ray and Associates, can receive comprehensive feedback from a variety and really a totality of our community. All events will be facilitated by Ray and Associates executive search team members. This evening, the board received documents Related to this, board members.
So while there has been there has been work that is being done, as I mentioned earlier, not all phases are available to the public view. But we're very excited to bring forward tonight all of those avenues in which we encourage and really desire the public's input. The following are Ray and Associates recommended practices. Ray and Associates has a proprietary anonymous online survey for all stakeholders. It is scheduled to go live on Wednesday, March 6th and continue through March 22nd. There is a survey link that will be uh, communicated through uh, many channels through the board. Another recommendation is town halls in morning and evening in all five area advisory regions. Additionally, there will be focus groups held across the county across three days. There'll be invited key stakeholders and there are uh, lists of key stakeholders which include obviously the stakeholders that regularly come to the board and these documents will be attached to board docs after the board votes on them. Um, so there are three pages, two and a half pages of community input groups uh, that will be in focus groups. Additionally, the board will develop a web page and on that web page, Anyone can go to it and see all of the different uh, activities that are happening, the different opportunities for input, and be able to uh, contribute in that way. So do I have a motion to accept the recommendations from Ray and Associates to provide all of these opportunities for community input? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Is there additional discussion, questions, or comments? Ms. Joes? When you're talking about the focus groups, is this what you're talking about, this group? Yes. So they're going to meet with each of those individuals as well? What they're doing is the focus group to be effective. They're going to have about 20 folks involved. Does, does that include focus groups not recognized by the Board of Education? Because I see a lot of personal people, uh, personal emails from people, which I don't think classifies as focus groups, unless you're just talking about the regular suspects up here, TAPCO, PTA. I, I see so, another page over here, individuals. Does that constitute a focus group? So they'll... Th our um, executive assistant is working in arranging the logistics with Ray and Associates in to, into groups that would be uh, appropriate. We were given the opportunity to submit names and groups and so forth. Um, so if there are board members who did not yet do that, then essentially um, the list from Ms. Scott, they could all be tagged into the South when they go to the southwest area and do the focus group? Or would they be meeting each individual separately? They, they are not meeting, they're meeting in focus groups. Okay, so it would be southeast, and then Julie's got a lot of individuals here that I see, so that would be one bulk group that they would meet in the northeast area. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, although there's names on there that are from other areas, so logistically, Ms. Gover is going to be working that out with Ray and Associates. And you think that's doable in two days? That's the timeline, right? Two days? Well, it's across three days, three and they days. are bringing their team of four consultants. So they're making arrangements so that geographically, the focus groups have, there's a wide variety across the county. <coughs> Mr. Offerman? Yes, well, I have no, uh, uh, I cannot predict the number of people who will attend. It seems interesting in the staff and community input open forums that the morning sessions are an hour long, but the evening sessions are only a half an hour long. I, I don't think that's adequate time. Uh, I could see some places where people will attend that in, uh, in numbers that would make a half an hour meeting not, uh, 
not not long enough. So I would ask that the, that the board consider requesting Ray and Associates to change that to at least an hour, at least as much time in the in the afternoon or in the evening as as, as they do during the morning. So would you like to offer an amendment? Yes, yeah, so I'd like to. I'd like to, I'd, I'd like to, to amend the motion that. Uh, that uh, the uh, evening meetings on the 21st, which is a Thursday, uh, are from 7 un until 8 o'clock p.m., rather than 7 to, uh, to 7.30. I second. And is there any discussion on Mr. Offerman's amendment? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Oh, excuse me. Well, I think it may have been a recommendation of Mr. Ray and Associates, but they, they left it up to us as how long we would like to have it. Okay, well, I think it's appropriate for us to vote as a board to um, accept Mr. Offerman's uh, amendment to the recommendations. So, again, all those in favor of Mr. Offerman's amendment to extend the time frames uh, to an hour, please raise your hand. Are there any opposed? Any abstained? The motion carries. Thank you. Any other questions? Discussion? Mr. Kuhn? Just so, I'm, just so that I'm crystal clear on this, there's three pages here that we've been provided with, with various groups throughout Baltimore County and individuals. Um, and my understanding from what has been said is that focus groups will be drawn from all of these various groups, or are there other meetings with groups and focus groups. I want to understand what what we're planning on doing here. So again, Ray and Associates has standard uh, recommendations for focus groups that they engage with in the community. And then additionally, there are other groups that based on these board members in this community that they have in addition. All right, so, so that I'm, I'm clear again, when we're, when we're looking at this, these lists, there could either be a meeting with, say, for instance, um, AFS CME, or they could be part of a focus group based on what Ray and Associates determines to make the most sense. Well, again, Ms. Gover, and Ray and Associates are executing this as they traditionally do. So the bargaining units, my understanding is, each have their own focus group. Any other questions? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. Thank you. Our next item for this evening is item P, board member comments. And for that, I will go around the room seeking comments from our board members. And did I start on that side last time? Mr. Offerman, would yeah. you like to go first? Yes. Uh I uh, should comment that I've had the pleasure today of uh, uh, visiting Chesapeake High School and uh, was impressed by the variety of programs they have that specifically address uh, the needs and, uh, and, and interests of the area, including an uh, extremely strong R ROTC program, uh, an extremely, uh, an extremely uh, uh, intense use of the of the stat program in terms of daily instruction uh, across the entire range of uh, of uh, curriculum that I witnessed today and uh, you know, it's, I, I think it's a, a school that, that that's really moving in the in, in the right direction they have an attendance with uh, they have a challenge with their attendance and they're working on that uh, but but certainly uh, you know I, I think it's a school where it, uh, seems like the the uh, the members of the staff seem who I talked to uh, Individually, seem seem very excited and, and are, are very very positive. And uh, I will meet. I'll be visiting Parkville Middle and uh, Woodmore uh, Elementary over the next uh, over the next week. Thank you. 
I would just like to take a, a minute to um, recognize all the athletes that um, played and competed uh, to the best of the ability over the winter session. I know that uh, various schools and um, uh, Towson High School being one of them is having their awards um, um, activity tonight. Unfortunately, I couldn't be there. Um, but I, I also wanted to, to say that I'm looking forward to uh, uh, spring sports kicking off. I know that they've already started tryouts and teams are forming it as we speak and that um, uh, that that's uh, an exciting prospect for everybody involved, parents, uh, students, teachers, coaches, um, anyone that likes and enjoys sports. Uh, I also want to uh, thank um, uh, staff for providing information so that we can uh, attempt to do the best job that we can. And I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. I want to thank Abby Baton. Thank you, for real. <laughs> but I really want to thank the staff, and I want you to share, particularly to those folks who are in the schools, that the, the highlight of any of my days, when I'm in a classroom, in a building, and watch the children do all of the things that we talk about and that we want and all of the reasons that we got on this board. And I hold tightly to those moments. And I wanna thank all of you on staff who have helped me to understand what it really means when I read about tribulations giving us and guiding us to patience and patience to endurance and endurance to character. You demonstrate character. And at the beginning I said, I hope this is not an example of the Peter principle for me reaching my level of incompetence, but I think not because I've learned patience, endurance, and I hope that my character is developing exponentially every moment and with every breath I take being on the school board. Thanks to all of you for what you do. Mr. Hayden. We have so many great things that happen in the school system. Uh, they happen not exclusively, but pretty close because of the people who work in the system. Not because of the people who serve on the board, but the people who work in the system and make things happen. And it's incumbent upon us to tell them thank you. And, and I'm not sure we do it often enough, but thank you to everybody who works on the staff and does such a great job, and to our interim superintendent who also fits that mold. At the same time, there are, excuse me, always things that we have to realize who we are and what we're doing and how it comes across. There was an article in the Sun paper on March the 2nd uh, uh, under the you, Your Turn thing, and it was called Budgeting in the Dark. And a Baltimore County school board member says the system needs major reforms in the budget process so that, so that she and her colleagues can make good decisions. The only reason people were unable to make good decisions was because they didn't do their homework. There's plenty of information out there. There were um, sessions offered, and to the best of my knowledge, nobody took any, took the, uh, superintendent staff up on it to come in for a one-on-one two session to talk about the budget. I pay her for that extra stuff, I mean. So. <laughs> but, so that didn't happen. So instead we have a picture, and I, I think the Sun paper should take a little bit on this one. We have a picture in the paper that has that headline that I just read and a picture of the interim superintendent. Nothing could be further from the truth. 
it indicates that the author of the article did not, does not understand what budgeting is all about, does not understand appropriate what? Oh, I'm sorry, my mic was not on. I, I believe we need to be more appropriate towards fellow board members. And what does that mean? You can't disagree with anybody? You can, I just think we need to be appropriate. I'm being appropriate. I'm talking about something that impacted our school system because of inaccurate information that came out that blamed things on the superintendent, literally, and the school system that was inaccurate. And if someone does not bring it up, no one knows that it happens. Mr. Hayden, I would just suggest that if you have a certain experience that you want to portray that was your experience in the budgeting process, that's certainly appropriate. I still don't have a clue what you're talking about unless you just don't want me to talk. No, I think individual board members have individual experiences and this is an opportunity for board members to speak about their experiences and if you would like to share your experiences of the budgeting process or school visits or anything else, I think that I think that would be appropriate. So now I'm being told what I can say and what I can't say. Is that where you are? No, I'm simply asking that we maintain an appropriate demeanor. It's been discussed by board members that that's what we'd like. So I'm just making a recommendation. My demeanor that bad? Don't push that one because you're really way off. But what we had was an article in the newspaper. The article in the newspaper had a picture of the superintendent there. And this was so inaccurate and impacted the school system so poorly and affected the school system and the way people look at us it would be very nice if board members who choose to write anything would make sure that they understand what's going on before they do that. And uh, the, the, the Sun Paper's decision to put the superintendent's picture there, uh, I might add, was an exceptionally bad one because she doesn't belong there. Uh, she pushed hard for the budget to get money that we desperately need. And if we don't push to get that, we're going to have more trouble than we've ever dreamed of. And uh, so I think it's incumbent upon us that we thank the superintendent for those efforts and that we move forward as a group to say, what can we do uh, to make sure we get what we need for our kids and don't take shots when we don't understand what's going on. Ms. Adekoya, did you have any additional comments? Everybody have a great rest of the week. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. The effectiveness of any organization or institution is not measured by the absence of problems, but how we address those issues when they arise. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Ms. White and her staff for being responsive to two particular concerns that came up in my community this week. Um, first, I'd like to thank particularly Mr. Jim Corns for meeting with me and addressing the issue of device connectivity from students' homes. This is an issue that I've been inundated with um, requests on. Mr. Corns spoke with me at length. I believe I pulled him out of another meeting to have that conversation, and I appreciate his time and willingness to address the concerns that parents have had with students not being able to connect to the resources they need to complete their homework. I heard that parents are taking exorbitant efforts to enable their students to do so, even driving to their children's schools in the evening so that they connect to the BCPS network from the school parking lots and having students complete homework from there. So I appreciate Mr. Corns taking the time to um, listen to the information I had to share with him, and I'm confident that he and his team will work to get to the bottom of those issues. Secondly, I'd like to thank Mr. Kevin Smith for meeting with me and speaking with me this afternoon regarding the transportation problems in the Northeast. Again, I'm confident that he and his team are taking all measures necessary to address those issues on behalf of our children. So thank you to Mr. Smith and to Mr. Corns, and have a good evening, everyone. Ms. Jose? Thank you. 
Um, since I've been on this board, we've discussed budget, superintendent search, audits, and a myriad of issues, including cutting stat, cutting curriculum. Uh, there's been a zero focus on children <coughs> and how we can make our schools better for the 21st century. As a board, we have to renew our focus. We are here for the children, all children to focus on equity, learning, education, and social cohesion. I had the opportunity to attend the Maryland VEX Robotics Competition a couple of weeks ago, and it was thrilling to see how our STAT teachers work and um, develop robotics. Hereford High was uh, in the forefront, but I certainly want to see more high schools out there. And how could we facilitate that? That's a question I would like to ask staff. I would also like to thank staff for their professionalism, their devotion and strength of character because it takes much more strength to be quiet than to speak out. So kindness goes a long way. Thank you. Mr. McMillian. Uh, I have a couple things I want to say real quickly. When I go out in the community, I tell people we are a new group. And like a new group, a new team, a new faculty, a new class, you know, we will get better working together. And I firmly believe that. Uh, I don't expect us to agree on all topics, and that's impossible to expect that. And I really love the interplay, that the opposing views, because it stimulates me to think. And I love to think across a wide range of topics. I want to give a shout out to John Bushman and the Educational Channel. Those guys sit in a little closet in the back and videotape all these meetings. And I told Bushman today, <laughs> better have a big smiley face. I told John Bushman today that I'd do everything I could to up this meeting and get us done on time. Uh, secondly, I want to I want to second what John Offerman said about Chesapeake High School. Uh, he invited me to 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 go on that visit with him today, but I did. I taught there for 25 years. I went down that road every day for 25 years. I didn't want to disturb or, or disrupt Mr. Offerman's experience there because I thought I might have that influence. So I'm really happy that you had the opportunity to see that school, those teachers, those those students at RTC program, and see it firsthand for yourself, and I second everything that you said there. Uh, I attended a dance program at Middlesex Elementary last Friday at uh, 2.50, and it was a variety of dance, swing dance, all, all kinds of dance, and it was great to see the parents come out in the last couple minutes and dance with their kids, and uh, it, it was a wonderful experience. Yesterday, I spoke to the Kenwood faculty uh, for a couple minutes before their faculty meeting, and I forgot to mention I was a Kenwood grad. And, I, I wish I'd have done that before I say goodbye. So thank you very much. Thank you, Miss. <laughs> no, I didn't. I had my snow boots on. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Mack. Um, I've had a very busy month. I was um, very, very excited to be um, invited to literature night at the Hillcrest Elementary School. And I was involved with PTAs when my kids were in school, but I have never been to a PTA event where there were one thousand people. There were so many people at this event. I, the little girl I had with me, we tried three times to get into um, one of the book classrooms, Leagues Under the Sea, and we had to come back for a fourth time. They gave away books to adults, children, um, science books, travel books, anything. It was just a really neat night, and I'd like to congratulate um, Principal Jennifer Lynch, her staff, and her PTA for setting that up because it looked like a whole lot of work, but it was incredible. Um, I'd I also would like to again thank the Randallstown NAACP for the opportunity to attend the meet and greet. I attended Open Meetings Act training and learned quite a bit. And upcoming, I have four school visits, a PTA meeting at Woodlawn, the Southwest Area Council meeting, and I just see that I'm invited to the Cultural Coalescence Showcase at Western Tech that's coming up. So I look forward to all those events. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Scott. Yes, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you to staff and everyone for, the, for your hard work and keeping us informed and answering all of our questions. It is 
really truly appreciated. Um, I would also like to thank the NAACP of um, Baltimore County for hosting us, uh, actually several of us that were there. Some of us were a part of the forum, um, others came in attendance, and for allowing us to speak and to have um, the public to have an opportunity to have their questions answered. Forums, um, informational settings, community events like that are so very important, so I look forward to more of those. I've had the opportunity to visit a lot of schools in my district to work with and see a lot of the work, rather, of our hardworking teachers and principals who work tirelessly to educate our children. And so for that, I'm, I'm extremely grateful. And I just look forward to more visits um, and basically getting around my district more, working more with board members, and um, I'm looking forward to what the future holds. Thank you. Thank you. And now, Ms. Rowe. So last year, the General Assembly passed uh, the Anti-Bullying Task Force. And this task force was um, established to study the issue of bullying in schools in order to make actionable data-driven policy recommendations to the governor and the General Assembly, this board, and the community. And I'm happy to accept the work of chair for this task force because for some time our community has been concerned about bullying and the state data has shown that across the state bullying and incidences of bullying have increased um, over the last three years and so I think this is a very important issue to study and it's a very unique opportunity to be able to have a task force that is a cross-session of the people involved in schools and in bullying and to come up with well-reasoned recommendations on what we can do to make our schools safer um, in a way that's equitable and fair for everyone. And because bullying is very much a student issue and the task force bill asks for the student member to be on the task force, I felt that it was very appropriate to ask Ms. Halima Adekoya if she would vice chair the task force. And she has committed to do the exorbitant amount of work vice chairing this task force entails. And so I'm very happy for us to work together and to get started in this. And um, I hope that it will be a very beneficial experience and will produce good actionable items for our state. Thank you. I just want to dovetail what a lot of board members have talked about, which is um, school visits, because really that's when we can get in and see the work that's happening from our principals, other school leaders, and staff. Um, I was also happy to attend the state wrestling tournament where Baltimore County was very successfully represented. I'm not gonna name all the schools and the individual winners because I will leave someone out, but we were very well re uh, represented. And it's just another opportunity to see all of the different ways that community, teachers, students are engaged um, in helping to, to grow. Um, so I appreciate all of that and the opportunity to do that. The next item is item Q, information, and I just wanted to let everyone know that attached to board docs is the revised 2018-2019 school calendar that will reflect the changes uh, related to our inclement weather, which I, along with Ms. White, hope is over for the season and that we will get to some spring weather. That leaves us to our uh, last item, announcements. Our next board meeting is Tuesday, March 19th, here at 6.30 p.m. And I just wanted to say, in our own way, we all love you very much, students, staff, and community. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you.